Hello everyone. Um, so this lecture, this mini lecture, is going to cover um, the first part of chapter four, extensions of Mende Mendelian genetics. So to begin with, this one short lecture is just going to cover the first three sections of that um, chapter. An overview of simple inheritance patterns, dominant versus recessive alleles of genes, and then some environmental effects on gene expression. So to begin with, um, let's talk about wild type and mutant alleles. So just to remind you guys, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the class, but wild type alleles is the sort of catch-all term for alleles that are found at a high incidence in naturally occurring populations. So normally wild type alleles don't confer any particular advantage or disadvantage on an individual. Um, they're just around. Um, and people that have wild type alleles are considered to be, you know, relatively um, normal. So um, mutant alleles, on the other hand, are usually rare and basically come in two types, one of which we've talked a lot about, and the other one we've not really talked a lot about so far. So recessive alleles we've talked about a lot. Um, those are normally mutations that decrease the function of the protein that they um, encode in some way. Whereas dominant alleles um, represent a mutation that basically allows a, a protein to gain function somehow. Um, and remember, we're always talking about mutations at the DNA level that then go on to affect the coding of that gene, which affects the, the protein that that gene makes. Now, dominant alleles, you've got to be a little careful with the nomenclature here. Dominant alleles essentially are different. So we've talked about dominant and recessive relationships between alleles in the same gene. A dominant allele um, is actually called so because this is a rare allele that arises in the population um, that has some kind of dominant power over the wild type allele um, or wild type alleles present in that population, and I'll give you an example of that in just a minute. So when thinking about these wild type and mutant alleles, you should be aware that in large populations, such as the human population, you can have more than one type of wild type allele. And one way to think about this, for example, is hair color. Hair color is relatively complicated genetically, but there are many alleles, none of which have, you know, a particular um, positive or negative connotation on the organ. So red hair versus brown hair versus blonde hair, those are all totally normal phenotypes. Um, uh, and that's an example of genetic polymorphism. So just to recap what we were thinking about in the previous part of this class, when we were talking about Mendelian genetics, um, here's an example of tall and dwarf plants that we looked at earlier. It's a single gene, we represent it by the letter T, um, and then uh, depending on your genotype, you have a different phenotype, right? So the genetic relationship here is that big T is dominant over little t. Uh, therefore, if you have um, at least one big T, you are tall. And if you have at least, uh, if you have two little t's, you're a homozygous recessive plant, then you're dwarf. And you get this classic three to one ratio when you cross two heterozygous plants together. That three to one ratio tells you that one gene is involved and there's a relationship of dominant and recessive Mendelian um, relationships in this case. So that's all well and good, but just think about what that means for a second at the molecular level. And what I mean by that is the levels of protein that are present. So if you look, and I'm gonna use the, the little arrow as a pointer here, but if you look at the genotypes here, this is now referring to a simple Mendelian trait, flower color, right? So at the bottom, we have two purple flowers and a white flower. This is a simple Mendelian relationship. So one, one big P is sufficient to give you a purple flower, right? So in the first case, we have homozygous, homozygous big P, purple flower. In the middle case, one big P, one little P, heterozygous, you get a purple flower. 
two little peas, homozygous recessive, you get a white cow. Now, if you look at um, T, very nice. Um, if you look at, uh, my wife just bought me a cup of tea, which is very kind. And she even bought me a cup with DNA on the mug. Hmm. Oh, apropos. Um, so, uh, as I was saying, uh, in the homozygous recessive case, um, you get a white flower. Now, think about what's going on at the level of protein here. So, if we look at the level of functional protein P, in the homozygous state, let's imagine that both of these big P genes, two copies of the same gene, right, are both making protein. So you have 100% of the possible amount of protein that this plant can make, and it gives you a purple flower. In the heterozygous case, we have one big P and one little P. Let's assume that the little P allele results in no protein being made, which means that the functional amount of the purple protein here is 50% because we only have one functional allele. And that still gives us a purple flower. Now, in the case of the homozygous recessive uh, situation, we have 0% of the purple protein, we get 0% purple flower. In other words, it's white. Um, now, this is the interesting one, right? If you look at big P, little p here, what you're talking about is half the amount of protein because just one functional gene instead of two and we still have a purple flower which is kind of weird right but that's how you have to assume that simple mendelian recessive traits work um what about dominant alleles i said there's also rare cases where you get dominant alleles where um an allele can function in a dominant way over the wild type allele Something like Huntington's disease is an example of that. And here's a pedigree, a human pedigree, uh, where we see a dominant um, trait being passed on to a progeny. And what you see here is that every affected child, so this one in generation three, child number five, has an affected adult. These guys have an affected uh, parent, sorry. Uh, and these guys also have an affected parent. This is a dominant trait. What does that mean and what does it mean in terms of protein function? Well, in terms of a dominant trait, all you have to inherit to get the disease is a single allele, single mutant allele that acts dominantly, which is why these are passed from every generation to the next, because you get one disease allele from your dad and you have the disease. That's it. Um, so remember firstly that dominant mutants are pretty um, unusual. They're less common than recessive mutations. And that's kind of explained when you think about how they, they function. So there's three sort of molecular explanations. How do you get a mutation that makes a um, protein act in a dominant way over the wild type version of that same protein? One is the idea that the new protein uh, with the mutation acts as a gain of function mutation. For some reason, it's become mutated so that the protein gains a new function. There's something weird in the cell which causes um, a disease state, even if you just have one copy of that allele. The other idea is that it acts as a dominant negative. This is sometimes called a poisoning effect where somehow you get a mutation in one of the alleles of a gene that acts in a negative way on the normal protein. It kind of kills the normal protein, therefore acting in a dominant manner um, and causing an issue. And the third way is a long word, haploinsufficiency, that actually means something very simple. And it's basically the opposite of what happens in Mendelian situations. So I just said back here, right, that 50% of this protein is enough to give us essentially 100% of the phenotype, purple flower. If this is not the case, then if, for example, this was a pink flower, for example, or a white flower, that would mean that 
it was acting in a haploinsufficient manner. In other words, the loss of function mutation, the heterozygote can't make enough product to give the wild type. So that's some examples of dominant and recessive alleles. Dominant alleles can also act in a way that is very confusing to human geneticists, which is uh, called incomplete penetrance. Um, here's another human pedigree. And what you see here is that um, this disease, shown in black, skips a generation and then shows up in a generation down here. This is called incomplete penetrance. Of course, this particular pattern could also be consistent with um, a recessive allele, a recessive disease. But in this case, um, for example, well, in this case, we'd have to know the identity of the gene and exactly what the mutation did. But this is an example of incomplete penetrance, which is a dominant mutant um, that sometimes shows phenotype and sometimes doesn't. And there are genetic reasons why that can occur. But it's very confusing when you're studying an incomplete penetrance um, situation in human diseases. One example of um, an incomplete penetrant phenotype is something called polydactyly. Polydactyly actually means that you've got extra fingers or toes. So if you look at this gentleman on the left of this slide, you see that he has count them one, two, three, four, five fingers and a thumb. On the other hand, he has the same, right? Five fingers and a thumb. So his hands look phenotypically, you know, normal in the sense that, you know, if you just saw half of his hand, you'd just see some fingers and a thumb. But when you look at the hand as a whole, he has an extra functioning digit on each of his, his hands. And this is one, an example of a trait that can skip generations. It's also a nice example to show you guys because um, this particular trait has different levels of what, it, what is called expressivity. Again, consistent with the idea that it's sort of a borderline effect. Sometimes you see the phenotype, sometimes you don't. And when you do see it, it can have a high level of expressivity. In other words, the trait is expressed fully. This person has a fully functional extra digit, or it can have a low expressivity. So this individual has a relatively normal looking hand, and they have a little vestigial digit sticking out the end here next to the pinky. So in other words, the polydactyly trait is not expressed at as high a level on the right than it is on the left. So that just gives you a couple of examples of um, uh, different types of genetic phenomena, incomplete penetrance, skipping generations, and also expressivity, the amount that a trait Uh, other things that can affect phenotypes. So these kind of differences, these threshold differences are thought to be because of genetic background. There's a whole bunch of genes that we don't know about that are also influ influencing this trait, which means that depending on the combination of genetic, your genetic background, you might cause the phenotype to skip a generation, or you could cause the phenotype to be expressed at a higher or lower some other examples that can affect phenotypes um, are environmental and not genetic. Um, and there are lots of examples of these, and here's a couple of them. Um, temperature can affect phenotype in a, very, in a very specific way. On the right here, you see two adorable pictures of Arctic foxes. Interestingly, this is the same fox, but if you look at the top version, it has kind of a a grayish brown coat and in the bottom version it has a white coat this is like a superpower if you ask me but the gene that makes coat color change in this box is affected by temperature in the summer the gene makes a brown pigment sort of a grayish brown pigment and in the winter when it's cold and there's a lot of snow and you want more camouflage the um, fur turns white this is, this is because this gene product, this protein made by this gene, um, is temperature sensitive. When it's warmer, it makes a darker coat, and when it's colder, it makes a lighter coat. Very cool. 
Um, another example of an environmental effect on a phenotype is actually human fingerprints. So um, human fingerprints are mostly caused by genetics, but they're altered also by basically environment and the environment that you developed in, in utero, in the womb. So pressure on a fetus um, by the amniotic fluid and the movement of the amniotic fluid itself changes your fingerprints, which is why identical twins, despite being genetically identical, or at least very close to being genetically identical, um, actually have different um, fingerprints. So um, that is, I think that's, that concludes this lecture. Yeah, so that concludes this first lecture, um, this mini lecture on extensions to Mendelian genetics. So if I can figure out how to stop this, um, Okay.